Everyone, today I have the great pleasure of introducing Dan Freed uh, from the University of Texas at Austin, who will talk about the two-dimensional easing model revisited. Well, thanks, Mike, and good to see, see everybody. Pleasure to be here. So this is joint work with Konstantin Telemann, as it says. And so let me begin by introducing the two main characters of the story. The first main character is the easing model in two dimensions. And this is pretty much the way you'll see it in physics uh, books and so on. So it's in the plane with a square lattice. And there's a parameter here, which is a positive number beta, that's the inverse temperature. And the model concerns a configuration of what are called spins. So a spin here is this arrow that's either up or down, which we can think of just as the cyclic group of order two, plus one and minus one. And so at each vertex of the lattice, we have this spin, this element of this group. And now we weight um, this configuration of spins. So this means that we weight over all the edges of the lattice. So we look at the edge and we ask whether the uh, spins are equal or opposite. And so that product is either plus one or minus one. And we weight it like that, taking the product over all the edges. And what's called the partition function is the sum of that quantity over all possible configurations of these spins, functions from the vertices to this group. So of course, that's, there's an infinite set of these functions. If that set were finite, then we could take this total and divide each weight of each configuration by that total, and we would get a probability measure. But we're supposed to think in any case that this is something like that. And uh, one thing to note right away is that the behavior is very different at the two extremes when we take beta very large, which is low temperature, and beta very small, which is high temperature. And the way that these weights are set up, at low temperature, these spins want to align. And they'll tend to align. And in fact, if you take the limit of low temperature, you would get that measure focusing uh, concentrating on either all the spins being plus one or all being minus one. Whereas at um, high temperature, the opposite limit, the spins tend to be random and we would get a more uniform measure. So one thing we're going to do uh, pretty quickly in the talk to avoid infinities is to replace the affine plane in this infinite square lattice by a compact surface two-dimensional surface and a lattice inside the surface, which then has a finite number of vertices, a finite number of edges, so that all of these products and sums are finite. And we're also going to use a generalization where we replace the cyclic group of order two by an arbitrary finite group. And this parameter beta then is replaced by a function on the group. So the model will be determined by a finite group and a function. So that's the first character in the story. The second character, and the one that we're going to be working towards, is uh, topological field theory. So this grew out of um, this idea of a topological field theory, grew out of quantum field theory. And the axioms that we use for that came in the late 1980s, first for two-dimensional conformal field theory, and then uh, for topological theories. And really, it was a sea change uh, for mathematicians being able to access these ideas in physics. And um, yeah, so what roughly do these axioms say in the topological case? Well, we're going to, so the field theory is going to be a function, but it's a function between categories. And the domain is a Bordism category that was introduced by Milner in his work on the H cobordism theorem. And so the objects of this category are closed manifolds. There's a fixed dimension N. <clears throat> and so uh, here the, the objects are dimension N minus one. They're closed manifolds. And what this map does is it attaches to that a vector space. So this is a functor from this Bordism category to the category of vector spaces where the objects in the codomain are vector spaces. And in the Bordism category, the morphisms are Bordisms between two closed n minus one manifolds. So that's pictured here, a compact n manifold whose boundary is partitioned into the incoming and the outgoing pieces. 
And that gets linearized under this functor into a linear map between the vector spaces you assign at either end. So it's really a linear representation of this nonlinear structure of bordism. So one way to think about it, if, if we don't think of the category, but we think of this uh, bordism as giving an equivalence relation on objects, we say that two n minus one manifolds are bordant if there exists such an X that maps one to the other, then that's the classical uh, bordism group you get, uh, which was you know, studied very much by Pontryag and Tom and so on. And topology, especially in the 1960s say, was concerned with invariance of bordism, which is to say uh, homomorphism from that abelian group to an abelian group like the integers, for example, the signature of a manifold. And so in many ways, this axiom system is very natural from topology. It's one category level up where you remember the bordism, you don't think of it as an equivalence relation. And instead of an integer, you get a vector space and linear maps between them. Okay, so one more thing to say, those bordism groups are groups because of the operation of disjoint union. And here we also have disjoint union in this category and vector spaces also have a composition law, which is tensor product. And this functor preserves those composition laws. So this is the categorical analog of an abelian group and a homomorphism of abelian groups. All right. So there's an extension of these axioms where we go down from n minus one manifolds to n minus two, n minus three, and so on. And that's going to be a very important ingredient in the story. And um, I just wanna say this kind of axiom system and especially this extended axiom system has been very impactful in mathematics. We see it in lots of places with uh, not invariance, uh, with mere symmetry, with uh, invariance in, in symplectic geometry and symplectic topology, geometric Langlands theory, and so on. So the axioms are actually have had already, you know, over these 30 years, an amazing impact in mathematics. The project that I'm going to discuss today is one of several uh, recent projects which are actually looking back at physics and saying, looking at what we've learned in mathematics about the structure and develop and seeing what it can say directly about problems in physics. Okay, and a comment is that this same kind of axiom system is meant to apply to all quantum field theories, not just the scale invariant ones like conformal and topological field theories. So the talk will be to take this first character, the two-dimensional easing model, and we're going to transform it really in three stages, bringing in topological field theory in uh, kind of increasing amounts. So uh, the first thing I'll do is explain again, the easing model now in the situation of compact manifolds. And I'll introduce a basic duality between high temperature and low temperature that occurs in the theory. And then the key idea is a symmetry in this model. And I'll explain the symmetry and how in field theory, there's a way to, to use the symmetry in a very strong form. And so that strong form is actually in a three-dimensional theory that I'll explain. And then the way it's used, and this is the kind of second incarnation as a field theory, is that the easing model occurs as a boundary, a two-dimensional boundary of this three-dimensional theory based on the symmetry. And so we'll see that that can lead to certain predictions and so on. And finally, at the end, um, we'll go fully into topology and I'll show you that in fact, in this particular case, we can make everything into uh, something topological. And in particular, we'll see a proof of this duality in a strong form. Okay, so do feel free to interrupt with questions. Um, okay, so let's look again at the easing model, but now we're going to look at a compact manifold and we'll have a lattice inside. So I haven't written a formal definition. There is one in the paper. It's, it's really an embedded finite uh, graph we're not allowing loops, but we're allowing various things. And so that's what's pictured in purple. And um, the model, as I said, depends on a group. Here, we'll start with an abelian group, just this cyclic group of order two, where we have this temperature as the parameter. And so that gives us a function on the group, which at plus one is e to the plus beta, at minus one e to the minus beta. So these spins again are maps from the vertices into this abelian group. 
And um, if we have such a configuration, then on each edge, we can look at the value of that spin at each vertex and we can take the ratio, or the, in this case, the ratio, which is either plus one or minus one. So given a configuration in a particular edge, we can deduce a group element. And then we can take the product over the edges of that group element. That's the weight that we had before. And the partition function again is summing that over all of the different configurations. And so if we have a closed surface, we get a number. And now the number is well-defined. It's a finite number because the product and the sum are both finite. We've taken out the infinite plane. So as I said, we can do this for a general group and a function. And what do we need about that function? Well, one thing we want is that the function is even because if I'm taking the ratio at the ends of this interval, I haven't oriented the edge. And so I want the function to be even so I don't have to worry about orienting the edges. And the function has to be a weight in this kind of statistical mechanical model. So it has to have some positivity. And so we ask that the function be positive but also that its Fourier transform be positive. So in the abelian case for a finite abelian group, we have a Fourier transform and we ask that it be positive. In the non-abelian case, there's an analogous kind of Fourier transform. So here I've indicated what this space of possible models is for um, two different simple cases. Here's the cyclic group of order two. And if we have a function like that, we can scale it by a positive number, we'll get an equivalent model. So we can mod out by scaling by positive numbers. And then there's only one parameter left and that's the beta. And so if you like the moduli space of these models is just a line. If we take the cyclic group of order five, then we get a more interesting uh, set of possibilities. So this space of these functions, these admissible functions, mod multiplication is always a convex uh, space. And in this case, there are four extreme points and there are two parameters and that's what it looks like. Okay. So here's the symmetry then, which is the important feature. And it's very simple to see because the model, this partition function just depends on the ratios at each edge. And so if I take each uh, group element at the vertex and I multiply it on the left, say, by a constant element of the group, then of course the ratio doesn't change. And so just multiplying all of these spins uniformly by a constant group element is a symmetry. So in the original picture where we have spin up and spin down representing the cyclic group of order two, it just means we flip all the arrows. That's a symmetry of the model. And it's that symmetry that we will eventually exploit. Okay, so I've said this probabilistic interpretation. Now that uh, works well because this set of configurations is a finite set. And so we have this finite set and we get these positive numbers that add up to one. So we get a probability measure for each beta. If we're back to the uh, model with a cyclic group of order two, the classical case, and as I said, at low temperature, when this parameter goes off to infinity, this measure then becomes just uh, supported at the two uh, constant functions, where the, the spin is the constant function plus one or constant function minus one, or pictorially all spins up or all spins down. On the other hand, if we let beta go to zero, then the way these weights are constructed, the measure tends towards the uniform measure. So a purely kind of uniformly random system. And so that again is the typical interpretation. Those are the limits in this moduli space of these models for the group mu two. And then a typical thing that one computes in the physics is you know, the expectation value of some function against this measure. And the function might be, for example, to pick two vertices and to look at the spins and um, take the product plus or minus one and average that against this measure. So that's a correlation function that's telling you how correlated those two sites are. That's what's called an order operator. There's a disorder operator that will come in, but I'm not going to uh, say much about it. Okay, so let me get to the duality that this model has. And this duality works when for any abelian group, not just for the cyclic group of order two, but not at the moment for a non-abelian group. So the best way to 
uh, say the duality, or at least an efficient way, is to say it in the language of uh, just elementary cochains and chains. So if we think of the lattice, the cochains, uh, think of it as a topological space, just a graph, then the zero cochains are the functions from the vertices to A. In other words, those are exactly the configurations. And the one cochains are the um, functions from the edges to A. And the, the co-boundary operator takes a configuration and it's taking each edge to this ratio or difference in the abelian group of the uh, values at the boundaries. So we can write this partition function, which is here, we can actually write it as an inner product of two functions on the one cochains. So these one cochains are a finite set. So that finite set has a natural functions on the finite set has a natural kind of L2 inner product, if you like. And that's what this means here. And while one of the functions is just, you, you take such a, a, you know, you take this function theta that you're using for your weights on the group and you multiply that over all the edges of the group values. That's one function. And the other one is the push forward of the constant function one here, which is the one that's telling you you're summing um, you know, the differences of the edges. So just this elementary rewriting says that up to a constant, we can write this partition function as the inner product of two functions on this, um, on this finite set, but it's more than a finite set. This set of cochains is a finite abelian group. So therefore that finite abelian group has a Pontryagin dual group, the group of characters, and the group of characters are then the chains as opposed to cochains with values in the Pontryagin dual group. So these two pair um, to, the, to the Q mod Z. And so these are Pontryagin dual groups. Similarly for the one cochains and the one chains in the dual group. And the dual of this operator delta is the usual boundary operator. So now we can use the Fourier transform and Parseval's formula to say that this inner product is the same as the inner product of the Fourier transforms up to constant. And how can we express the inner product of the Fourier uh, transforms? Well, one, we get the Fourier transform of this weighting function theta, which means this little function theta on the group gets exchanged with its um, Fourier transform on the Pontryagin dual group. So that's where we're very heavily using an abelian group here, of course, in the language of cohomology as well. And then the Fourier transform of this other function, which is basically the characteristic function of the boundaries, becomes the uh, co-boundaries, becomes the characteristic function of the uh, co-cycles. So the boundaries and the co-cycles get interchanged. But basically it says that the model um, we got, we have an equivalent model by taking the Fourier transform of the weights. So if we do that, for example, for the cyclic group of order two, then the Fourier transform of this, the weights turns out to be the beta, the check that satisfies this equation given beta. And so that gives an involution on the space of these betas. So it's just a reflection around some fixed point. And that fixed point is then an important point in the, in the theory. But notice that this involution is taking high temperature to low temperature. So it's some kind of duality in the model that's taking, uh, relating high and low temperature. So that's the kind of standard physics story. And let me point out some features and then some issues with it. So uh, one is that we didn't quite get the partition functions to match, we were off a little bit by homology. Co-boundaries went to co-cycles and not quite co-boundaries. So there's a little bit of topology that's off in this standard story. That's known, of course. Um, I didn't say how those correlation functions transform under this Fourier duality, but those transform into what are called the disorder operators. And again, the, the correspondence is not, not very clean. I said that there's this duality for an abelian group, but not for, we can't do the Fourier transform Pontryagin dual group and so on. We can't do that for a non-abelian group. So that's missing a dual. And I told you at the beginning that at low temperature, there were these two kind of stable states, all spin up, all spin down for the group mu two. Whereas at high temperature, there's just one. 
And if these models are supposed to be the same, then that's a mismatch. Why are there two at low temperature and one at high temperature? So what's happening there? So as I said before, the key idea is to use the symmetry group and to use the full strength of that symmetry group. And so we'll resolve these problems and also be able to do more. We'll be able to make some predictions about what this model looks like at low energy. I have to even tell you what energy means. We'll be able to define more general class of models. And in the end, we're going to, as I said, put the story entirely in this topological framework. The last one I won't have time for uh, today. Okay, so before I go to the symmetry, let me um, give a kind of quantum mechanical interpretation of this easing model, which will be how we're going to look at it. So this is the first step, first incarnation of putting it into the uh, setting of topological field theory. And so what we're going to do is construct, again, a functor, but now, these are going to be one and two manifolds, the Bordism category, as I said before, Milner's Bordism category. But as in Milner, when you can have orientation, spin structures, almost complex structures, and so on, we can have different kinds of structures on the manifold. And here we're going to have a lattice. But again, we're going to have a linear representation of this Bordism group. So what are the objects? Well, the objects are going to be finite unions they have to be compact closed one manifold. So a finite union of circles, but with a lattice, a finite lattice. So essentially a polygon inside. You should think of course of the purple as being along the circle. I've just drawn it as a polygon so you can see it a little bit better. And to this, we have to attach a vector space. And what's the vector space? Well, we have the configurations, meaning that to each vertex, we attach a group element. And so we'll just take functions on those configuration spaces, uh, sets. That's the, uh, the vector space that we attach under this functor to a one manifold. And now if we have a bordism, well, our bordism should again be a surface, but now the surface might have boundary. So it's a bordism. It's a bordism from the incoming part to the outgoing part. And um, the whole surface has a lattice like this. The lattice has to, nicely restrict on the boundary. So we get those polygons on the boundary. And now if we think of configuration, well, that's just a function from the vertices, all of these vertices to the group, we can restrict that function to the incoming boundary and we can restrict that function to the outgoing boundary. So in other words, the configurations on this bordism form a correspondence from the configurations on the incoming boundary to the configurations on the outgoing boundary. And so we get a correspondence diagram just of these finite sets. These are just finite sets. And what do we want to do? We want to linearize the, this, uh, this correspondence diagram. In other words, we want to get from this correspondence diagram a map from the functions here, the complex valued functions on this finite set to the complex valued functions on this finite set. So if we start with a complex uh, function on this set, what do we do? Well, we pull it back, we get a function here. Those are all the configurations of the surface that restrict to the given configuration on the incoming boundary. We then multiply by an integral kernel. We multiply by some function on these configurations, and then we push forward. That push forward just means that I sum that function over the fibers of this map. It's a finite map, map between finite sets. So the fibers are finite sets. So that's a finite sum. So this operation, this push forward is really a finite version of Feynman's path integral. If we were doing this in quantum field theory, a la Feynman, that step would be the path integral. And the integral kernel in this case is made from our weighting functions. And so if we do that, then um, that's what this model gives. So for example, if the surface is closed, then the incoming boundary is empty, the outgoing boundary is empty, these functions are just single point sets and we end up summing over all the configurations as we did before, we get the partition function, that number. So this reproduces it, but now this gives you this actual um, functor where we glue together these bordisms, then the linear maps we get compose. So that just follows formally from the correspondence in this construction. Now, 
if we take a particular kind of bordism where we take a um, one dimensional manifold together with the, uh, with the um, polygons, we just take a polygon here pictured a triangle and I cross it with time, that's my bordism. Well, then we get something that in school we used to call a prism. This is a triangular prism. And we can do the, um, apply the functor here, we'll get a linear endomorphism of the vector space attached to this, uh, in this case, triangle. And in the physics, that linear endomorphism, well, in statistical physics, that's called the transfer matrix, but it really has the role of a time evolution through one click of time. So time is discrete in this model. It's a statistical mechanical model. So you can think of it as the evolution. It's not unitary time, the usual time in quantum mechanics, but it's what's called wick rotated or imaginary time. And so this represents e to the minus the Hamiltonian if the time is one. And so in that way, you can use this to define a Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian is an operator which, whose eigenvalue is a self-adjoint operator, whose eigenvalues are the energies. And so this gives a notion of energy. And later I'll talk about low energy behavior of the model. It's this kind of energy that we're talking about. All right. So that's the kind of physics setup of this easing model. And let me now bring in the symmetry. So I like to think of this in geometry in topology. This is something we do. And even beyond that in, in mathematics is kind of turn problems with equivariance into problems of parameterized families. It's kind of equivariance to families principle. And the way we do it is to fiber over the classifying space of the group. So in topology, this is called the Borel construction. If you have a topological space with a group acting on it, then you can make what's called the Borel quotient, which is a space that fibers over BG, over some other topological space built from the group. But there are lots of different incarnations of this that are um, more rigid, and we're going to use a more rigid uh, version of that here. So what is, in other words, a model for BG for a finite group? Well, you should think of BG as really being G bundles, principal G bundles. So G is again a finite group. And what is a principal G bundle? Well, it's a covering space, but it's a Galois regular covering space where the group of deck transformations is the group G. And we don't require that the total space be connected. So it's a principal G bundle is, is one way to think about it. And these principal G bundles have symmetries. They have automorphisms. So we no longer get a set of these bundles, but we get a groupoid or a space of these bundles. So for example, if we look at the circle, then such a bundle is determined by its monodromy. If you go around the loop, you get a group element. That's only defined up to conjugation. And so a model for those bundles is actually the group acting on itself by conjugation. So that's the picture that I've drawn here. This is a picture of the bundles on the circle for the group SIM3, the symmetric group on three elements, the order six group. And so you can see that we have the six group elements represented here. And then for every group element and every other group element, we have the conjugation that maps us from this group element to some conjugate group element. So the connected components you see are the conjugacy classes and the stabilizers are the centralizers of elements. So this is a very familiar structure that one studies in you know, first course on group theory, solo theorems and so on. So that's what these coverings look like over the circle. This is an equivalent groupoid. And so fibering over BG in the easing model is going to mean bringing in and coupling somehow these principal G bundles. And so how do we do it? Well, before when we had this surface, we said we were looking at configurations of spins, a spin being a group element assigned to every vertex. Now we're going to allow, we're going to think rather than a function to the group, we're going to allow ourselves to have a non-trivial potentially G cover, G principal bundle. And we're going to take a section of that bundle over the vertices. So, if that bundle were the trivial bundle, we would have group elements, but now we've kind of spread it over possible bundles. That's the spreading over BG. 
And so here's a picture over an edge, for example, if we have the cyclic group of order two. So we have a double cover, which is trivial over the edge, but now we have a section over the endpoints, over the vertices, and we can still ask for the group element that compares these, because even though they're over different points, given the edge, we can transport one of them to the other end, and then we have two points in the same fiber, and those compare by a unique element of the group G. That's what it means to have a Yawa G cover. And so we still get a function given this section now over the vertices and given an edge, we still get a group element. And so that's the only step, that's really the key step in everything I'm going to tell you of extending this model and putting the symmetry in, in a very strong form. So, so in other words, everything now is a function not only of the surface and the lattice, but also of a principal G bundle or this Galois cover. So in physics, those are, in field theory, those are called the background fields, the ones we don't sum over, the ones that everything we compute are functions of. So in this case, again, it's function of the, the, the manifold Y, this lattice lambda, and this cover Q. We're summing over the sections of this bundle over the vertices, those are called the fluctuating fields. So those are the ones we sum over, those don't appear after that. Okay, so what kind of structure do we get? Well, the partition function is now, if I have a closed manifold Y, before we got a complex number, that was our partition function, or even real number actually. Now we get a function of bundles. So given such a Y, here's a picture of the bundles, some groupoid like this. What does it mean to have a function? It just means for every spin configuration, we get a number. And if two of them are connected uh, by a symmetry, then we get the same number, that's all it means. And the original partition function is the value at the trivial bundle. So this is exactly extending the thing, as I said, over BG, over these bundles. So what about the vector spaces? Well, when we have a closed one manifold with a lattice, we got a vector space. Now we have to have a closed one manifold, a lattice, and a, a, a cover of this uh, one manifold some kind of G bundle or G cover. So again, this is the space of these covers on uh, S. And so now for each such, um, such cover or each G bundle, we get a vector space. So in other words, now we get a vector bundle over this groupoid. So what does that mean? That means that we get a vector space at each point and that each arrow between them goes over into a linear map. And since th these arrows are invertible, it's a groupoid, we get isomorphisms. So for example, at the trivial bundle, what do we get? What well, at the trivial G bundle, well, we get our vector space, that's the configurations, functions on configurations we had before. And now we see the um, symmetry group here, which is a copy of the group G acting on that vector space. So this is the original symmetry of the easing model that we had, and now we've spread it out over non-trivial bundles, what physicists would call twisted sectors in the model. And those twisted sectors then give rise to um, more state spaces and more structure. So for example, if we think of the cyclic group of order two, then you know, if we have the circle, just say, and we have some polygon, think of an n-gon where n is very large, then um, if we have the trivial bundle, we just have plus and minus one at each point canonically. And say at low temperature, we have the constant function plus one, the constant function minus one. Now we have the non-trivial double cover of the circle. That's this twisted sector, which would live somewhere else in this, in this picture. And now we have sections of those. And so we can't anymore assign a plus one or minus one consistently because when we go around, the notion of plus one and minus one would switch. So those are the kinds of twisted sectors. It twists as we go around the circle. Okay. So that's the kind of standard form of using the symmetry that we would do in geometry, I think, is putting in the BG. But field theory offers an even stronger way of using the symmetry. And that turns out to be thinking about the symmetry itself is encoded in a field theory of one higher dimension dimension three in this case, and thinking about our model is living on the boundary 
being a two-dimensional boundary for this three-dimensional theory. And that's a very powerful idea that you see in lots of contexts. Here it's nice and simple, everything's finite, so we can do it. But uh, in quantum field theory, one also sees that in many contexts, and even cases where the symmetry is no longer a group, but something more abstract. But it could be understood in this kind of way as living on the boundary of something one higher dimensional. So let me explain then what this three-dimensional theory is. Um, I think there's a raised hand, I see. Uh, hi, uh, Dan, this is Juven Wong. I hi, wonder, may I ask a question? Yep. Uh, it's also probably along the same line. If, if it's not proper time, you can answer later. So I think uh, here the, um, the talk is stressed uh, around this uh, topics on two-dimensional statistical EC model and also a uh, relation to this e EM duality for the three-dimensional. Uh, well, I'm getting there. Yes, so the thing is that I was wondering, say, is there some reason not consider uh, other dimension, for example, maybe four dimension also? I see. <laughs> well, maybe that's a better kind of question for the end of the talk. Oh, okay, that's okay. Okay, then we're gonna, I can Okay, so I ask again at the end of the talk, I think. Four dimension and five dimension, I think maybe they have some- Okay, about thank that. you. Thanks, thank you very much. Okay, so let me explain then this three-dimensional finite gauge theory. And so again, G is a finite group, and now the theory is three-dimensional. So initially we're going to have the Milner type Bordism category of two and three manifolds. And um, again, this kind of functor. So the objects are closed two manifolds. The Bordisms are morphisms like this. And to this, we're going to attach a vector space to this a linear map of the vector spaces. And so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to again do this finite sum and this sum over correspondences. But now rather than functions to a group or sections of a bundle, we're going to sum the actual bundles. So the fluctuating field, the thing we're summing over are the principal G bundles over the manifold. So for example, if we now have a closed three manifold, what are we summing? Well, we're just summing the constant function one, we're just counting these bundles. But as always, when we have automorphisms, when we're counting uh, anything in mathematics with automorphisms, we have to divide by the number of automorphisms. We have to normalize the sum by the internal automorphisms. And so here we're summing these bundles and weighting it by one over the number of automorphisms. That's the natural measure. And so up to that kind of weighting, this partition function in this theory, the number it attaches to a three manifold is essentially counting bundles. And if we have a closed two manifold, we need to get a vector space while we get functions on bundles. So it's just analogous to what I was saying before about the easing model. And again, if we have a bordism as in this picture, then if we have a G bundle over the whole bordism, it restricts on the incoming boundary to a G bundle there, it restricts on the outgoing boundary to a G bundle there. And so we get a correspondence diagram like this. But now it's a correspondence diagram, not of sets, finite sets, but rather of finite groupoids. We always have the internal symmetries of G bundles. And so we can do the same push pull. There's no integral kernel because we're weighting everything by one in this theory. But um, we have to be careful that when we do this push, when we sum, that we sum using the weighted by automorphisms, as we said. So up to that, it's just the same thing we had before, linearizing correspondence diagrams, this time of these groupoids of bundles. So that's the basic theory in two and three dimensions. And now we bring in this idea of extended locality, which is crucial, as I said, to many applications. So what's the idea there? Well, see in this theory, if we have say a closed three manifold, and we wanna compute the number, this number, what we can do is we can slice it. Think of slicing it by a Morse function perhaps. And so we take uh, you know, some regular value, inverse image of a regular value of a Morse function. We can slice this three manifold into two three manifolds with boundary, with common boundary here. In other words, write this closed three manifold as a composition of morphisms, of bordisms. One bordism on this side, one bordism on this side. And because we have the structure of this field theory, we could compute something for this left-hand boardism, something for the right-hand boardism and combine them to get that number. 
So that's a kind of locality because you can compute by breaking up your manifold. But your three manifold, you can only break up in this way by a single Morse function. We don't get fully local. We would like to break it up by say two Morse functions and be able to glue in two directions. And this is three dimensional by three Morse functions. So we can basically glue the manifold together by um, from balls, just everything from balls. So we need to go to manifolds with corners rather than just manifolds with um, boundary. And so that's the idea of extended locality. For example, here, if we take the two manifold, well, that's what we're going to attach a vector space to. But now we'd like to be able to construct that vector space by chopping this surface up. We'd like to say that that vector space itself is locally constructed. And if we do that, well, we have to somehow write an equation for that vector space in terms of something we attach on the left and something we attach on the right. And that equation has to take place in somewhere I can write an equation in sets or in vector spaces. And so that's a category. So we necessarily, as we get further locality, we necessarily bring in more categories. And so there's a way to think about what category we should put for in this three-dimensional field theory in co-dimension two on a one manifold, what category we should put. We could think of that in terms of this same kind of finite path integral, there's finite sums. I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through it, but basically what you end up doing is saying that we look at the groupoid of um, bundles again, that we're summing over on the circle. And what we wanna do is take functions to vector spaces. We wanna assign a vector space to each object and then an isomorphism of vector spaces to those arrows. And so what ends up is that we get an equivariant vector bundle over the group, equivariant for the conjugation action. So again, once you have this idea of extended locality, then you have to find out how do you, you know, what kind of structure is that? How do you assign something to it in these simple theories? <clears throat> but there's a way to do that. And as I said, what you get in this simple gauge theory for a finite group are these equivariant vector bundles. So again, that's like a linear representation of this groupoid, a vector space at each uh, group element in this case, and an isomorphism of vector spaces for every group element that acts by conjugation. Okay, well, that would take us to one, two, and three manifolds. And if we wanted full locality, we would have to go down to points. We would wanna cut even further, have three manifolds with maximal corners and be able to glue along corners and really have a strong form of locality. And it's always a question, what should we put here? Where should we map to? And um, for our particular problem, it's, it's an open question in general, really, what, what are good uh, codomain categories? But for ours, we're going to use tensor categories. And so this is a kind of categorified ring theory, if you like. It's well studied. For example, there's a book by Eddinghoff, Galaki, uh, Nikšić, and Ostrich, which lays out the theory. And um, others, many others, I've just listed here uh, one paper, have studied it in the context of you know, category theory, have put the, the um, statement in, put that theory, that kind of categorified ring theory, in a form that's suitable for using in a field theory this way. In particular, they form a three category, these tensor categories. And so the message just is that once we get down and want to use the power of locality, we have to trade that by having algebra that gets a little bit more elaborate, elaborate in the form of higher categories. But that trade-off is well worth making. So for example, once we do that, we have zero manifolds in the game. And what I'm saying is a zero manifold maps to a tensor category. And in this case, what is the tensor category? Well, it's just a version of the group ring of the uh, finite group where the ring in question is the ring of vector spaces. So it's not an ordinary ring, it's a kind of categorified ring. But if we have a vector bundle over the group, that's what it means to have a sum of group elements with coefficients vector spaces. And we wanna define a product on those, that's the group ring structure. Well, it's just convolution. And it's the usual convolution, except instead of multiplication and addition, we have tensor product and direct sum of vector spaces. So these are familiar objects, but perhaps in a slightly categorified uh, way. <clears throat>
So what's the payoff for going this fully local route? The payoff is that we have a strong theorem called the cobordism hypothesis that says once you're fully local, then in principle, since every manifold can be glued together from balls, you'd like to think that this functor is determined by what it does on balls, or in this case, on a point. And that's what the theorem says. It says that the whole field theory is determined by what happens to a point, what you assign to a point. So in this case, for example, everything is determined by this uh, group ring of the group, this categorified group ring. But the more powerful statement is not that it's just determined uniqueness, but existence, that given a suitable object that you attach to a point, we can build the whole theory. And we can compute everything by essentially Morse functions, chopping up the manifold until I compute from a point and use all the gluings. And that's a very powerful result. And that's what we're going to use here. Okay, so let me not elaborate there, but. Let me say that if we're thinking then about these tensor categories that are suitable for these theories, there's one that pops to mind given a finite group, which is the category of representations. And again, the tensor, the tensor product now is literally the tensor product of representations. For the group algebra, the tensor product is convolution, but here it's the tensor product of representations. And now this abstract theorem tells you you get an abstract theory. And this is in some sense purely quantum. We don't have it by summing over some kind of bundles or something like that. I don't know any description like that if G is non-abelian. If G is abelian, well, then what is a representation of an abelian group? Well, we can look at the Pontryagin dual group and decompose a representation by its multiplicity spaces. And so to a representation, we get a vector bundle over the Pontryagin dual group. And tensor product goes over into convolution. And so in fact, for the abelian group, this theory built on representations is the old theory built on the Contriagin dual group. And so that correspondence works, um, well, okay. There's a different correspondence, sorry, which is that given a group G, I can make this group algebra, I can make this representations and as a, tensor category, this categorified version of a ring, these tensor categories are Morita equivalent. And being Morita equivalent means that the field theories you build by the cobordism hypothesis are equivalent field theories, isomorphic field theories. So you get for any finite group, abelian or not, you get these two very different views of these three-dimensional field theories. And you can ask, well, okay, that's what happened on a point. The the idea is we should be able to compute everything from a point. So what happens if I go, for example, to a closed surface where I get vector spaces? So the vector spaces are functions on some kind of cohomology group. And if we do the abelian case, where then it really is on a cohomology group, then um, what we find is that the, uh, the equivalence between these two theories is implemented by a Fourier transform. Again, these are Pontryagin dual groups there are dual groups only in the case when the surface is oriented. Otherwise you need some twisting. And, um, and that's what this duality works out to be. And so this is what's called electromagnetic duality. So uh, as Juven said, that this three-dimensional theory enjoys in the abelian case, this electromagnetic duality. It's a kind of finite version of the usual electromagnetic duality in Maxwell theory which happens in four, not three, space-time dimensions. Okay. Again, I think in the interest of time, I, I want to, I, there are, in these gauge theories, there are natural kinds of operations one does where you have not just a three-manifold, but a loop, a, an embedded one-dimensional sub-manifold. And there are two kinds of these operators. They're called Wilson and Epoch loops. I think I don't really have time to explain them. Um, but uh, the point is that these are exchanged, in fact, under this electromagnetic duality. And so these kinds of operators are, in fact, parameterized by the same category we've been talking about, G mod G. And in terms of that, we can see what this is. But I think I'll run out of time if I tried to explain that. So let me now bring back the main character, the easing model. We started with the easing model, we put it on compact manifolds, so we had finite sums and finite products. 
we brought in the symmetry and I told you how to construct this three-dimensional gauge theory. And now what we want to do is then see the easing model as a kind of boundary theory for it. So what does it mean to have a boundary theory? It means that we're going to enhance this bordism category by allowing ourselves to color, in this case red, some components of the boundary where we're putting, off, putting on the boundary theory. So it's, it's in essence coning off the boundary so the boundary isn't there anymore. It's what one does in say elliptic PDE or any kind of PDE where you have boundary conditions, you're kind of making so the boundary isn't there, you're compensating for the boundary. <clears throat> in the field theory case, it's more geometric in a way, you're just coning it off explicitly by expanding the domain and allowing um, that. So what we're going to do then is take this gauge theory and put the easing model on the boundary, allow it to be on the boundary. But the boundary then gets this lattice. So on the boundary, we have this lattice, whereas in the interior of this three manifold, we just have naked three manifold, ordinary three manifold with no extra structure. And the easing model is somehow this extension. It's what allows us to extend, not to again, naked manifolds, but the wordism category where we put these lattices on the boundary. So if we do that, then we recover what we had before. The structure recovers the idea, the spreading over BG, that the partition function is a function of bundles. That's what we said initially. But it also gives you much more um, structure. For example, these lines that I talked about, these Wilson lines in the gauge theory, once you have the boundary, you can take those Wilson lines and make it not an embedded closed one manifold, but a kind of neatly embedded one manifold that ends transversely on the boundary. And we ask that for the Wilson line that the boundary ends on a vertex of the lattice. And lo and behold, if you compute what you get, then this becomes the correlation function that I mentioned at the beginning this kind of order operator between two sites. These other ad hoof operators are again, uh, operators you can see in this picture where you let these loops end now in the middle of a face instead of at a vertex. And again, we'll, we'll see that the duality exchanges those. So in other words, we can put this symmetry in a strong form, we can end up, um, putting this as the boundary theory for this gauge theory. All right. So again, I think uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to say much about this. So let me um, skip a little bit. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so let me skip over to the last part, which is we wanna go and make a fully topological construction. And so far when I've brought in the lattice, I've really only done one and two manifolds. I haven't brought in zero manifolds. I haven't done fully extended. And now we're going to do this fully extended bit. And so what we're going to do is start with this three-dimensional gauge theory. And we're going to introduce boundary theories for it. So it has two very canonical boundary theories. One of them is um, what you might call Dirichlet boundary theory and the other one a Neumann boundary theory. Now, maybe I should say uh, one of the things I skipped, let me just say quickly, that, um, that if we want the boundary theories that don't have the lattice, so they're purely topological, then a version of the cobordism hypothesis says again that that boundary theory is determined by a point. And in this Morita category of tensor categories, what that means is that you need a module over this tensor category. And this is one of the powerful things that the higher algebra lets you do is classify what these modules are. So that's a theorem essentially, I think of Ostrich, that those modules, at least the irreducible ones correspond to subgroups possibly with a co-cycle, but we won't run into those. So for every subgroup of G, you get one of these, um, one of these purely topological boundary theories. 
And so there are two canonical ones because every group has two canonical subgroups, namely the trivial group and the full group, the non-proper subgroups. And so one of them corresponds to the regular module, just the ring, this categorified ring is a module over itself. And the other one corresponds to a fiber functor or an augmentation, if you like. And so in fact, we get this quartet of algebraic data, which is we start with this tensor category. We have these two different modules, these canonical modules, and there's actually a canonical intertwiner between them. And that data is now in, again, a souped up version of the cobordism hypothesis allows us to make um, something in field theory where we have a single field theory now in dimension three, we have two boundary theories and they're connected by what's called the domain wall. So here we're using the full power of locality to, um, to construct these, uh, these structures in field theory. So for example, we could take the disk, this is a two dimensional disk with boundary a circle, and we can color the boundary with these various things. So we color it alternately with these boundary theories and connected between them as the intertwiner, this domain wall between them. So now in this three dimensional theory, I said that coloring the boundary is like coning it off. This behaves like a closed two manifold. And so what we end up um, assigning to this is a vector space. And in fact, it's not hard to see that it's the vector space of functions on the group. You can see that because if we're doing this gauge theory, we have a classical model. What we have to do is take functions on the set where we take the set of bundles over this disk where all the bundles are trivial, but we need a trivialization over the red pieces. And if we have a G cover trivialized on the red pieces, then going across, we have a, a parallel transport that compares the trivializations. And that's the group element here. Okay. So now finally, what can we do with this theory, with this quartet of data? How do we relate that to a surface with a lattice? How do we relate that to this easing model? Well, here's the model we started with in the plane. So here's the lattice in the plane, these purple uh, diagonals. And what can we do? Well, we're going to take a Morse function, which in this case is basically sine X sine Y. This is what you do like in proving the poincare hopf theorem. We take a Morse function self-indexing whose critical points of index zero lie on the vertices. Critical points of index one lie in the edges like that. And the critical points of index two lie in the middle of faces. And now we cut out a little ball around each of those critical points. And then we alternately color uh, with the two boundary theories, the blue and the red, we put the red near the vertices, the blue near the faces, and in between we have this intertwiner. And so we get this kind of beautiful picture. And this is a picture we can evaluate purely topologically in our field theory. Well, it has a bunch of boundaries coming in from these disks that we cut out, but you see the boundary at a vertex and the boundary at a, um, at a face those give just one dimensional vector spaces. It's not hard to see that. And so these are constants. On the other hand, the boundary at the middle of an edge, well, you see that's alternately red and blue. And that's exactly the picture that we had here. And so at each edge, we have the possibility of inputting a function on the group. Well, those were our weights. And so in this theory, if you actually evaluate this using those weights from the function we started with, then what you find is exactly the easing partition function. So in fact, we put the easing partition function in this um, topological field theory, just completely in topology. So I just wanna say there's a physicist we learned after we wrote the paper who 20 years ago anticipated that kind of picture. He didn't have the technology of the extended field theory that we have now, but he did uh, have that, that kind of picture very beautifully. So you can use this picture then to construct all these operators I talked about, these loop operators. You can start with a general, um, more general theory. You can construct more general theories from Hopf algebras, and you can apply the cobordism hypothesis using this equivalence of um, 
these, this Marit equivalence between these categories to actually give a proof then of a very strong form of this duality that we started with. And so that's a rather exotic, I suppose, application of the cobordism hypothesis, which is ultimately a theory about diffeomorphism groups of manifolds really, and topology to prove something about this statistical mechanical model. Okay, so let me say again that we've taken this physical system and kind of morphed it more and more into a place where we could apply these tools in topology, but there are a lot of things that one would still want to do, certainly to relate this to the flat space model we started with, how these compact manifolds in flat space, and also to understand some dynamical phenomenon, which I didn't have time to really talk about the renormalization group flow, but those are two basic questions that you could try to understand in these discrete models that come from condensed matter physics, but are also basic questions in really understanding quantum field theories in general. So let me stop there and thank you for your attention. So thank you, Dan. Um, thank you for a terrific talk. There's, um, we have some time for questions. Um, uh, so Javen had a question first, and I think it looks like he wrote it out in the chat. So uh, oh, let me open the chat. <laughs> oh, and, uh, I don't know if I have time to read it. Can you summarize? <laughs> I, I can summarize. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk and lecture. Thank you. It's really nice. So I was wondering, so do you set up for the uh, 2D theory, 2D easy model and 3D and that, that's a really nice connection uh, that you have uh, this um, math theory. I was wondering, uh, is there some mathematical reason or is, is there something that you can say? Suppose we, we go from maybe 2D easing to some uh, 4D version of theory, uh, which I didn't specify what kind of Hamiltonian it is, but it will be slightly different. And then uh, the easy model you have is actually some uh, uh, this uh, spin the Z2, the Z2 operator X on the sides, and then couple the neighbor sides. But, but uh, uh, I suppose that uh, uh, similar phenomena happens, the, 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 the story that you have with the 2D and 3D theory, actually similar happens in the 5D TQT and also the 4D sum Hamiltonian theory. And what I was trying to say is that uh, I was trying to explain the 3D theory first, which is your story, and then I say why 4D fails. Okay, well, so, so yeah. let me just answer your question generally. I mean, right. there are lots of variations. Thank you for the question. There are lots of variations of this that you know already occur, say, in condensed matter literature, where you have higher dimensional versions, where you use, for abelian groups, higher cohomology, say, in place of the first cohomology and so on. And certainly there, I think, you know, you'll have uh, forms of this electromagnetic duality in higher dimensions, and you could imagine doing this model on a lattice. So I, I can't say we've thought that through in detail, but it's clear that such a thing will work. And, um, you know, as far as, uh, yeah, so anyway, just to say there are many generalizations. And actually in the Beeling case, we do, we can make higher dimensional versions and much more abstract versions by putting the abelian case in a more homotopy theoretic uh, picture. And then you actually generate lots of theories. Uh, in the non-abelian case, that gets harder as you go up in dimension, I think. But, um, you know, because, yeah, you won't have those kinds of electromagnetic duality, that Mariti equivalence that we had in any obvious way that I can see. But nonetheless, I think, you do start to see not just in these discrete theories, but in continuum quantum field theories, you start to see echoes of this idea of having the symmetry and the theory living on the boundary, but the symmetry is now more, more complicated, not just coming from a group, finite group or a Lie group. So maybe that's kind of general answer to your question. Okay, now maybe I'll ask you later. I think one, okay. one, no, one, Thanks. one, yeah, one Thanks. thing is changing the cut, there's a gauge field, you have a BZ2, uh, the cos line space Z2 and KZ21 to the B square Z2 and KZ2 of, of 2. And I think that in, in that version of 5D theory, you also have an EM duality. And yes, that's so that's what I said. I, I mean, you can generalize it even to where you have a spectrum and the kind of, you know, some kind of Pontryagin dual spectrum, and you can make theories that correspond like that. So that, that KZ22 would be one example of that. 
that kind of thing, absolutely. So there are definitely uh, strong generalizations of this electromagnetic duality. Actually, I should say that I had an undergraduate student that's quite amazing, Leon Liu, who wrote his uh, thesis about those kinds of dualities, and he's going to be a graduate student at Harvard in the fall. So he, he did actually write very beautifully about those. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll ask him and maybe also ask him okay. later. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Are there um, some other questions? Any, anybody else have any questions? I'm looking to see if there's other hands up. Well, while you're thinking, I have a question. Um, so <clears throat> in the case of ZMOD2, that corresponded to the classical easing model. Um, was there, do all of the, I think he's called them spherical fusion categories, all the models you get from those, do they correspond to, do they all correspond to classically studied statistical systems or? No, so, um... You know, these models based on groups, if you do finite cyclic groups, I think those are called POTS models or there are different variations uh, of those that are related. Um, so I think the models based on finite groups are studied in condensed matter. But if you were to take a Hopf algebra, a Frobenius Hopf algebra, that's neither commutative nor co-commutative, then um, no, I don't think those models are traditionally studied. So this kind of idea should generate new models. Yeah, we didn't follow up too much on that, but, but in principle, we've laid out a mechanism to generate new statistical mechanical models, yeah. Oh, that's terrific. Um, Thanks. I have a question. Yeah, uh, so uh, good to see you, Dan. Um, I, when you draw a graph on a surface, I can't help but think, suppose this is a Riemann surface and the graph somehow approximates its conformal structure. And, and, and then naturally one would want to not just take one graph, but finer and finer graphs and anticipate passing to a limit. I just wondered if this uh, um, development you've discussed today interacts with that kind of story. Well, that's a beautiful question. Um, and that's really what I'm hinting at in this last line that, you know, that is what one wants to do and one, you know, people do in statistical in condensed matter physics would be exactly to thicken the lattice, as you say, you know, and make it a closer and closer approximation and try to see, um, you know, if you can say something about that limit. So one of the things I skipped here is the space of possible models, uh, this restricted class of models for the cyclic group of order five. So these are the functions on the group. And basically what you'd like is to construct a flow on this. So there are some excluded regions like a discriminant locus, which here is what's called the phase transitions. There's a condition to be gapped, which makes a nice condition. And it's in this case conjectured to look like this. And we'd like to construct this kind of flow. And that kind of flow, if we're in the gapped region, should go to some extreme points and it should go to the extreme points that correspond to subgroups. So for this group of order five, there are actually four extreme points, but only two correspond to subgroups. On the other hand, if you are sitting on this critical locus and you try to do that process, then because it's not gapped, you won't, if it's not gapped, I should say, then you won't get to a, um, to a topological field theory, to something simple like these subgroups, but you should get to a conformal field theory, exactly. Oh, that's said, great. And then that's the what I wanted structure. to yeah. yeah. So that's where these kinds of algebraic techniques, I think we've made a lot of progress in understanding that, and that has certain applications, and I've sketched some here, and there are others, you know, many others. But the dynamics, you know, and really getting to there, and how, how we can move among theories, that's, I think, an area where, uh, you know, obviously it's been studied in different contexts, but not really integrated with this geometric point of view on field theory that you know, we've developed. And so I think that's a huge growth area, if you like, for the future, is to try to understand, put dynamics in exactly. So that's, yeah, very good question. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I see, Jovan, you have, do you have your hand up again? Yes, okay. So just make sure, so EM duality in your talk seems, uh, was possibly just mentioned the Z2 part, EM exchange. I was wondering, do you have an even larger structure like maybe SL2Z or GL2Z type of a structure for the duality? Uh, 
No, uh, no. The duality that we were looking at is just the involution. Yeah. Okay. Well, there may be more. I'm not saying there's not more, but what we looked at is just that involution. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, it looks like there's no further questions. So let's thank Dan again for a wonderful talk. And, uh, and thank everybody for coming. <laughs>